when did I have that first major shift? Because, you know, you practice this for so long, it becomes automatic, right? And it's like, you, you just get so used to being primarily in control of your thinking after years of practice of it, that it's like that what you're describing before, I'm like, oh yeah, what was that like? What was that like to have all of these incessant negative thoughts, you know, spinning around all the time that I really didn't have a lot of control over. Um, and, and I remember the first, one of the really first like kind of awakenings to that. And I was probably 2008, maybe 2007. And I was going through a rough patch and I was sleeping on a mattress in the living room of uh, my ex-girlfriend's apartment in Oceanside, mm -hmm. California, had no money, had no job, had like no gasoline to put in my car. It was a pretty rough time. And the cat didn't, you know, it was a male cat and didn't like another male in the house with mm -hmm. the two ladies. So would come over and pee all over my bed. <laughs> and I, and it, it wasn't a very oh. pleasant experience that I, you know, the, the only job I got at the time was like selling t-shirts down all the way. I had to go all the way down to Embarcadero, San Diego from North County to South County, take the train. And basically I would make enough money to like just pay for my train ticket to go back and forth. So it was like pretty oh. pointless. And, and I remember um, I was doing a lot of meditating and a lot of deep thinking at the time. And I started reading the, and I started chanting with uh, the Hare Krishnas. And I just, I've always had this kind of openness to all kinds of spiritual traditions. And so I started reading the Bhagavad Gita. And I remember one time I was reading it before bed and meditating. And then I woke up the next morning and I woke up and saw my thoughts upon waking for like the first time. I think probably ever in my life. And they were very negative. You know, they were very complaining. They were complaining about, oh, I'm laying on this bed that smells like piss and cats peeing all over me and I have no money and then blah, 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 right? All the poor me, poor me, poor me, which is understandable. It was a pretty rough situation, but I woke up with just these automatic negative thoughts focusing on all the negative things in my life at the time. And I immediately caught it. And the moment I caught it mm -hmm. and then decided, no, I don't want to have those thoughts. I don't want to wake up and have thoughts of negativity. It's that first awareness of it yeah. and catching it and stopping it, right? That it that starts to give you back control. And then from there, it's practice, practice, practice of, okay, no, what do I want to focus on? Let me focus on the things I'm grateful for. Let me focus on, look, I'm, I'm alive, I'm healthy. You know, I have opportunity in front of me. Um, you know, I've got, I don't know where my next meal is going to come from, but I know it's going to come like just the small things. I go outside and breathe fresh air and so start focusing on gratitude. And it wasn't too long after that, that opportunities did come and I did pull myself out of that. And I did start, you know, down a uh, continue forward into a good path. But, you know, taking and, and at the same time, it was like doing the dishes, and catch the thinking, oh, I hate doing dishes. This is terrible. I don't want to wash dishes and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, oh, no, I can, I can stop that and just be like, I don't have to enjoy washing dishes, but I can wash dishes and at least be at peace, right? I'm doing something productive. I don't have to be upset about it. And it's those little things you catch yourself. Would you would you agree with that? That it's like 100 percent. You can't see, you know, if you're listening, you can't see. I've been nodding and smiling the whole way along uh, because that is so fundamental to this practice of meditation. It's the ability to understand that, oh, I don't need to create the suffering in my own mind that I am creating. Like dishes is one that's actually near to my heart because I hated doing dishes, like <laughs> vitriolically hated them. Um, and so there was the point in time when I realized, hey, I'm going to have to wash these dishes. I can just think about this differently. And, you know, you can be mindful about it and, you know, classic mindful dishwashing, you're feeling the sensation of the soap and your hand against the dish. And you're like, oh, this feels so good. And it comes almost sensual. You're like, you know, in the water and maybe you're feeling all the different textures of the things in there. And rather than the food being super gross and grossing you out, which it used to do, like the floating food bits, you'd be like, oh, that's just a sensorial experience. I, I'm not eating it. You know, there's no reason it has to make me feel sick. It just... It's what's there. This food nourished me. It's still sitting there and being nourishing. Like I entirely flipped the script on the experience and it changed my experience of this basic thing, at which point you realize you can change your experience of almost anything. And yes, as your story 
suggests we can be in some pretty unfortunate scenarios in our life with chronic illness, you know, in the hospital with people who are sick around us with, you know, very difficult scenarios. And you can make the choice in those scenarios to allow the shittiness of the situation to overwhelm you or, and it takes a lot of strength and a lot of, you know, um, perception to do it, or you can begin to shift that narrative and accept what is that you can't change at that moment and start to be grateful and aware of that which you can shift, which is the way that you see the world around you. And this has an extraordinarily physiological benefit at times when you do it right. So there's amazing research out of Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn's lab. She is a Nobel Prize winning scientist. And she and Alyssa Upfeld did some of the first real research on the cellular impacts of meditation. And they took a cohort of mothers who are caring for chronically ill children. So these are moms who are super stressed caring for their kids, really worried about them, worried about their futures. And they taught half of them a meditation practice and the other half were the controls. And then they measured their cellular markers, um, particularly their telomeres, which is the length of your DNA. And some of you may have heard about this in relation to meditation because it became a very groundbreaking um, insight that meditation can actually change the length of your telomeres. So for those women that they had taught the meditation practice, you know, they asked them their perceived stress scales, you know, their level of anxiety in their life, et cetera. And the women were significantly less stressed. They felt more in control of their own lives, even though nothing had changed in their kids' care, but they felt a greater measure of control. And when they looked at their cellular markers, like their telomere length, they actually saw an improvement in cellular aging like an improvement in the cellular milieu, that's how Dr. Blackburn describes it, of those women. And the conclusion was that simply our thoughts, whether they be positive or negative, can actually have an impact on the cellular makeup inside of your body and the health and well-being of those cells. So your thinking really can affect your body and your physiology and your health. It's so true. And thank you for sharing that study. I mean, there's there's so many fascinating studies out there, right, about meditation and our biology and our physiology and how it impacts and helps improve our health, our performance, our our mindset, our literally the activation, upregulation of our immune system. I know there was a study I wrote about uh, a little while ago that um, followed, uh, I believe, it was eight people. Uh, it was a small study, but it was a, it was a good one who meditate an hour a day, and they saw a 65% increase in dopamine through one hour a day meditation. Thanks for listening to the Nathan Crane Podcast. If you found value in today's podcast, please share it with others. Subscribe to catch future episodes and leave a rating and a review. For more information or to connect with Nathan, check him out online at www.nathancrane.com and follow him on Facebook and YouTube at Nathan Crane. Until next time, this has been the Nathan Crane Podcast.